folks. <laughs> All right, it's a warm welcome from our uh, from our community. Commissioner Blight, how are you, sir? We got a seat for you right over here. I know, I, I see where you're. <laughs> Well, good evening and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is David McFadden. I'm the Executive Director for Regional Engagement uh, and Regional Stewardship at East EKU. Uh, we are excited to have you here tonight for our Town and Gown Vision 2020 Forum. Uh, this is uh, an event that kind of grew out of our strategic planning initiative from a campus level. Uh, from a community level, as I served as the president of the chamber, uh, there was definitely a lot of feedback about wanting to have more engagement uh, with the university and understanding where our master plan is, where we're going as we move forward. And we've got a lot of new faces uh, who, who are here uh, with us from, from the university side, uh, from the president's council. We are uh, very happy to have many of our local elected officials uh, here with us tonight, and specifically our county and city government, uh, an opportunity to have a dialogue uh, about where we're going as a community, how we make Madison County, Richmond, uh, a better place to live, to work, and to raise a family every day. And that's what we're all committed to. And uh, for that, we're, we're very thankful. Uh, Mayor Jim Barnes, Mayor, thank you for being here with us tonight. <laughs> Commissioner Robert Blythe. <laughs> Commissioner Donna Baird. <laughs> Commissioner Jim Newby. And Commissioner Jason Morgan. Thank you to the City Commission and, and our elected officials for being here. This is very important uh, for us to have you here, and we appreciate your time very much. From our county government, uh, Judge Executive Reagan Taylor, thank you for being here. Our Deputy Judge Executive, Colleen Cheney. And Magistrate John Tudor is with us tonight. Several of our other magistrates had other commitments. Uh, we've got one magistrate who works uh, who, who works the, the late shift, so uh, he uh, he couldn't be with us. But we do appreciate the county government, and we feel like this is definitely a city county campus uh, project that as we move forward, and we really look forward to uh, to having the opportunity to work with the county and with the city government. I want to quickly introduce uh, some of the folks that I have the pleasure to work with every day. Uh, it is truly a great pleasure to work at EKU and have an opportunity to work with great individuals who have a commitment to our institution and to our communities. Uh, our, our provost and chief academic affairs officer, Dr. Jana Weiss. <laughs> our executive vice president for student success and university council, Ms. L Ms. Uh, Laurie Carter. Our VP for Finance and Administration, Mr. Barry Porner. And our VP for Development, Mr. Nick Perlick. Mr. Matt Roan is our new Deputy Athletics Director and Special Counsel to the President. And of course, our President, Dr. Michael Benson. I'd be remiss if I did not recognize a couple of members of our Board of Regents who are here tonight. Mr. Alan Long from Richmond. Our staff regent, Mr. Brian Mackinnon. And I think Amy has already departed for New York, so she's our faculty representative is not with us tonight. Representative Rhea Smart is also with us tonight. Representative Smart, thank you for joining us. Tonight's a big night. It's a chance for us to share our vision for the campus, for the community, and how we might work together. Uh, we truly appreciate your presence here tonight, and we hope that as we move through the agenda tonight and have a chance for Dr. Benson to share that vision, to share some of the things that are really going to change the face of our campus and the face of our community, uh, that we have a chance to engage in some robust dialogue once we get through that opportunity. So once Dr. Benson finishes, I'll come back up. We'll have a little Q&A uh, as, as, we, as we have a chance to have that, that communication and that sharing of information and ideas. And we hope to really gather some information from this group to take back as we finalize our, our university strategic plan as we move forward. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Michael Benson, 13th President of the University of Eastern Kentucky. Is there anyone we did not introduce tonight? That was a lot funnier when the governor said it the first time I heard it. So um, It's great to be here. Thank you all for uh, carving out some time on a Tuesday night to be with us. And as David said, we believe this is a really significant moment uh, for our university. And as a uh, historian, I'm going to use some examples throughout uh, my PowerPoint tonight that I hope will illustrate 
Just what a pivot point, kind of that fulcrum moment this is for our, our campus and for our community. And I want to echo what David said. I'm really grateful to have on my right and on my left our elected officials. Um, I don't think I'll ever run for office, who knows, maybe someday, but I have enormous respect for people that do. Uh, I don't always agree with them. Uh, that's the kind of the give and take that we have in our democratic republic. But they voluntarily choose to be away from their jobs and their families and other responsibilities uh, to go to meetings and to go to hearings and to serve on our behalf. And I think we owe them all a, a tremendous debt of gratitude. Um, again, we don't always see eye to eye, but I hope that you know that we appreciate what you do for us. And it's, uh, it's great to have you all here tonight. Um, if I can start with uh, a few slides. Uh, you've heard me talk uh, throughout, and it's almost been two years now, what I call the three Ps, people, programs, and places. I'll touch on the first two uh, briefly, but tonight we really want to talk about the sense of place. What it, does it mean to be at Eastern Kentucky University? I don't want this conversation to be focused solely on our campus either. Remember that we have beautiful branch campuses in Corbin and Manchester and other satellite operations in Danville and Somerset, and soon to be a, a new one in Lancaster. Uh, but tonight we really will focus uh, in on Richmond and what it means here in our community. If I can, I'd like to, uh, to really follow the, oh, I think, I, there we go, follow uh, this agenda or this outline, if I might, touch on the three Ps, give a little bit of a, 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 the economy of Kentucky. And the reason I want to bring that up, I just came from a really outstanding program. I was fortunate to somehow sneak in, Leadership Kentucky, uh, and we had our, our orientation session this last week at Shaker Village. And a presentation was given by a, a, a retired professor of economics from U of L named Professor Coombs. And he gave some really interesting statistics about our Commonwealth. He called them the nine regions of Kentucky. And it made me think of a book I read several years ago called The Nine Nations of North America. It was written back in the 19, uh, early 1980s. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the author kind of crafts in his argument that North America is made up of these very nine distinctive areas. Uh, interestingly enough, Kentucky is listed in what they call Dixie, uh, which is next to the foundry, which is next to the breadbasket. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of, as you know, Kentucky is one of those interesting states where we straddle several different lines. Uh, but he, he, in his remarks to us last week, talked about these nine areas. And as you'll see, the, the areas that are doing well all have one common denominator. And that is a robust four-year public institution. Uh, and that is something I think we should be terribly grateful for right here in our home county. Not only to have EKU, but as my good friend Lyle Rolliffs tells me all the time, he's got the best job in America, I maintain I do, uh, but down there at Berea College, to have a college as unique as Berea just down the road is a tremendous, of tremendous benefit to us here in our county. Uh, Next, I'll talk a little bit about EKU and its impact on our county in terms of dollars and cents. What kind of economic impact do we have in terms of uh, as an institution and as employees? Next, I want to talk, really focus in the majority of my uh, remarks tonight on campus revitalization. How we're going to very intentionally breathe new life into our campus. And I hope tonight that you'll leave with a renewed sense of optimism uh, that EKU has got its best days ahead of it. Um, I'm a firm believer that I have the great benefit of building on what is in place. I've been preceded by some very, very capable leaders. And uh, nothing we do here is in a vacuum. Uh, people have sacrificed a great deal uh, for this university and for this community. And so I really pay uh, homage to them. But we're going to talk about the present and the future and then wrap up with, well, I hope, a, a robust discussion and comments from all of you uh, this evening. We had a chance today to, to uh, visit with our, uh, the firm that we fired to do, help us do our master plan. And Jana Weiss, who I maintain is the nicest woman I've ever met in my life, uh, next to my wife, Debbie, uh, <laughs> is uh, she brought up the point, which I thought was a very good one. We've done master planning before, but never have they coalesced or coincided with the university strategic plan. And I hope you've been paying attention. We've had uh, several different open fora, uh, open meetings, 
Uh, but you can go online and read what has kind of distilled down from Matt. How many meetings have we had? A lot. A lot. Okay, yes, that's the scientific term for a lot of meetings. Um, but from this strategic plan, we are focusing really on four things. So I hope tonight you'll commit to memory what those four are. And then there's an overarching one that really helps us do whatever we want to do here at the university within the confines of a budget. And I know Barry appreciates my saying that right from the get-go. But the first thing in our plan, uh, well, a couple just popped up. The first is that we want to focus on academic distinction. I believe a successful institution in the 21st century, particularly a public institution, has got to carve out a niche for itself. You cannot be duplicative. You cannot be redundant. You have to say to prospective students, faculty, staff, donors, legislators, we offer something wholly unique with the programs that we focus on and that we do particularly well. The second thing is we're going to uh, launch here very shortly a comprehensive capital fundraising campaign. The biggest in our history, uh, the most ambitious that we've ever done. Uh, it may be modest by some standards, but for us it's going to be a stretch. It's a stretch goal that I fully anticipate and fully expect that we will exceed. Uh, next, we'll talk about, uh, or the, the third kind of prong of the plan is the campus revitalization, which will be uh, an area of focus tonight. And next, no, oh, I keep hitting the wrong button here, uh, enrollment management. What are we doing to focus on our number one asset? We're only here at the Eastern Kentucky University because of one group, and that is students. What are we doing to retain them, to recruit them, to retain them, and to graduate them? and hopefully help them uh, get gainful employment. Now this last one, as I mentioned, uh, is all within uh, the parameters of financial stability and being very keen stewards and effective stewards of the re resources that are given to us. So that is our master, or, excuse me, our, our uh, strategic plan in a nutshell. To remind us again, the most important asset we have are people. People I see every day, uh, the, the hope that I see in the faces of our students, uh, I have the good fortune of walking around campus and seeing uh, the hope of the 21st century. Uh, if you think the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and if you watch the news on a nightly basis, you'd be inclined to think that it is, I'd invite you to come up to campus sometime and spend some time with our students. They will give you hope for the future. Uh, and we have the extreme good fortune to, to associate with them on a daily basis. And we see them everywhere. Uh, they're full of uh, vim and vigor and anticipation for what lies ahead. And it really falls to us to provide the best possible education and put them in a position to be successful. I said at my inauguration that uh, I would rather err on the side of giving every single student the chance to succeed and maybe to cut them a little more slack than uh, that might be anticipated. Uh, not to say to coddle them, because believe me, we're, we're around some students that are uh, helicopter parents of the 21st century are unlike anything that uh, you've probably ever seen. But still in all, our job is to put these young people in a position to be successful. Our programs really speak for themselves. Uh, I won't go through the, uh, the, the recent accolades that some of our programs have gotten, but uh, suffice it to say whether it's aviation or our nurse practitioner program or our forensic science, our criminal justice programs, uh, they are time and again being recognized for how exceptional they are. Uh, we got a word from Baptist Health just the other day. They said, the, you turn out more practitioners and we will hire them. Uh, number one, you've got the best program in the state. And number two, there is an acute need for them all over uh, the Commonwealth and all over our, our region. Of course, our fire safety program, our nursing program, I think uh, it was really captured this last graduation, which as you know was the first one we've had outside for uh, quite some time, with the double rainbow that somehow occurred uh, just as Lieutenant Governor Crit Llewellyn and the rest of the party was walking onto the field. And to have that celebration, that academic celebration of the, of the year conclude with that was a, was a wonderful thing. And we intend to do it again, so just mark your calendars for next year. Uh, next May we, uh, hopeful, uh, we'll hope for the, the weather to hold again. Uh, but that's something we would like to do. That picture up on the top left uh, is our incoming freshman class of last year. The number that I hope that you'll remember is 2,500. That's a number that we try to target every single year for our incoming freshman class. Our 
job, of course, is to try and retain that uh, number of students. But if we can get those, that number through the door, we believe we, are, we have in place a, a kind of sign, sound uh, uh, foundation uh, to allow us to grow at the level that we want to grow. That bottom right picture, of course, is Alumni Coliseum, uh, which poses a real challenge for us in terms of our graduation ceremonies. We don't have a place to hold everybody uh, that graduates and their families. So this year was a, a kind of a pilot program, but if you have complaints, just see Tina Davis after the program tonight. <laughs> Tina, you want to raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just a bit about academic excellence. I won't take a lot of time, but uh, there's some things that we should all be proud of. Uh, the, for the fifth consecutive year, we've been ranked in the top tier of regional universities in the South. Um, military friendly school. We have a reputation of being incredibly friendly to veterans, and that will continue. Uh, we, will con we will really focus on that. America's best colleges, the fact that we have 125,000 living alumni uh, that is a, a, not an inconsequential number. There are a lot of uh, colonels out there. I touch on athletics just briefly just to uh, showcase. I, I mentioned history. About four weeks ago, five weeks ago, we made history with three of our teams qualifying for the NCAA regionals in the span of seven days. That has never, ever happened before. And it was in the form of our men's tennis team, our women's golf team, and our men's golf team. They all won conference championships in the span of seven days, which had never been done by teams from Eastern Kentucky. And it led, of course, to our third Commissioner's Cup in four years, in our second, our second straight. So uh, needless to say, we are dominating the OVC when it comes uh, to our student athletes. But even more importantly, as it relates to our APR, our academic progress rate, and our graduation rate and retention rates for our student athletes. So we're very, very proud of that. Let me talk for just a second about uh, the sense of place. But as I do that, uh, uh, use as a lead-in some of the statistics I mentioned from uh, Professor Coombs. And the only reason I do this is it really, again, I believe highlights some of the unique aspects of what we have in Madison County. Uh, we are located right next to a major interstate. And the one thing you can't change in life is geography. Uh, we'll always be in the shadow, some would argue, of UK, and what UK does is their business. But we have so many things to our advantage that I'd like to focus on tonight. The first, as it relates to the statistics that, uh, that uh, Professor Coombs shared, those are the nine regions, and you can see some of the overlap. But we are kind of lumped in uh, with the Lexington area uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the Census Bureau, if the slide will advance, where should I point this? Should I point it to, at you? Okay, right there. Uh, the Census Bureau, and you probably can't read some of that uh, text, but uh, for example, Frankfurt and Mount Sterling and Richmond are considered micropolitan areas, and they are lumped in with the Lexington, what they call consolidated statistical area, uh, which is, uh, is the case for several different parts of our state. So when we talk about Lexington tonight, think of Madison County and uh, in Richmond, because we're in with that, uh, within, uh, within that county, within that, in that region. So here are the nine economic regions. You've got to the far west, Paducah and Purchase, uh, up along the Ohio River there, Owensboro and Henderson. Down below that, which is, of course, the kind of the farming belt of the state, Bowling Green and Hopkinsville. Louisville really is known as uh, kind of the, the major center of, uh, of labor and uh, manufacturing. Uh, to the south of us, of course, Cumberland. We're right there in the center there, the kind of the green shaded area. And just north of us is northern Kentucky, which, as you'll find out in a second, is the most densely populated part of our state. And then the two most sparsely populated, and the ones really facing some challenges, are Ashland and the mountain region. And uh, we'll talk a bit about why that is the case uh, in just a second. So, of the nine regions that is the most uh, densely populated, which one would you say it is? Okay, I gave that one away, so put it on. Uh, that will be on the quiz, but you got it. Way to go. Okay, let's try another one. Well, here we go. This is the density of population per square mile. You can see where Northern Kentucky is here on the far left, Louisville and Lexington. Uh, you can see Kentucky on average. You've got 109 people per square mile on average. And look at what uh, is happening on the far right of that graph. Uh, Paducah, the kind of the tail ends of the state, Paducah 
and the mountain region are on uh, are shrinking. Okay, population dense, density by county, and we are in the top 20. I won't count count now, but we're about what uh, two thirds of the way down there. You can see there, uh, Madison County. The top three counties over 30 times are 30 times more dense than the sparsest counties. Now, Professor Coombs talked about how a densely populated area has economies of scale that you just don't have in rural areas. It costs you less to get goods and services in. Infrastructure is usually far more advanced. Um, and there's some advantages to be, being in a, an urban area or a populated area. Of the nine regions, which has the least population growth this decade? I've kind of given that one away too, but it is the mountain area. And you'll see why or how this has happened. Look at Louisville, the population changed from 2010 to 2014. This is net in migration, uh, 35,000. Lexington, uh, we're in there with uh, Lexington. And then Ashland and Mountain are on the other scale, other side of that scale. As a whole, we had a net in migration of 74,000 people. So that's a fairly healthy, that's what? Two or three Richmonds, isn't it, Mr. Mayor? Uh, but. Uh, you can see the declining population at the tails of the state. Uh, population change, you can see who's had the largest growth. Lexington, Northern Kentucky, Louisville, Bowling Green. Remember I mentioned the four areas with the common denominator of a robust four-year public institution. All right, let's go to the next one. Howard, if you would, please. Natural population increase. This is just births minus deaths. So who has the, the, uh, the, the most robust uh, population growth uh, just in those terms? And you can again see the bottom of the scale, more deaths than births. Uh, that is, this should, th these are demographics that should be concerning to every county, uh, really in our state, but particularly ones that are, are facing some real acute challenges. Uh, I'll skip that one, that's kind of hard to read, so we'll go to the next one. Okay, I think I've got another quiz coming up here. Here we go. Which region has had the strongest job growth since the bottom of the 2008-9 recession? Okay, here are your here are your options: Lexington, Bowling Green, Paducah, Ashland. Lexington. Alan, why do you think that's the case? Go back one week. It does not at all. So that is, uh, and you can see the employment growth since the bottom of the last recession in all industries. So on the left side of the scale, Lexington, right next to us is the mountains where they've had a, what is that, a 10.6% decline. You can see Cumberland, Bowling Green, Hopkinsville. By the way, I will put uh, this presentation, I believe it's being taped, but I'll put the PowerPoint on our website uh, because I think the data is very, very important and uh, I hope it's helpful. Okay. Employment rate by region. Percentage of your uh, population who is gainfully employed and willfully employed. So look at that at Northern Kentucky. Again, densely populated. This is a per capita, of course. So you have to factor that in as well. We'll go to the next one. Okay. Which of the nine regions has the highest government payroll per capita? I got this one wrong. So I've only been here two years. So you native sons and daughters uh, should get this right. Lexington, Bowling Green, Louisville, or the Mountain Region? Anybody? Highest government payroll. I was surprised by this. It is Bowling Green. Why do you think that's the case? What do they have right there on the Tennessee border? Fort Campbell. Now, I understand that Fort Campbell is half and half, but the payroll operation goes through the Kentucky side. And uh, you can see what I'm talking about. Bowling Green and Hopkinsville, Fort Campbell, of course they have uh, Frankfurt. Frankfurt also is in the Lexington uh, kind of circle of dem uh, demography. And then uh, Fort Knox in the Louisville area. Okay, just a couple of uh, last ones. And these kind of bring us back to now a focus on on education, specifically attainment rates. Which reason has the highest rate of high school graduates? What do you think it is? Lexington, Owensboro, Northern Kentucky, or Bowling Green? 
Okay, Janice in Northern Kentucky. Anybody want to go with Bowling Green? Again, per capita, Northern Kentucky. Now look at the, uh, the, the percentage of our citizens on the right side of the scale. We are in the 83rd percentile of high school graduates in uh, Kentucky. That's something to be pretty proud of. National average is 86%. We could do better. Uh, but look where we fall uh, in Lexington, uh, Richmond, about 84%. So right very, very close to the state average. This next slide is the one that concerns me the most. Uh, not this one, but the one after this. Which reason has the highest rate of college graduates? Which one do you think has the highest rate of college graduates? We do. Again, when you factor in UK, U of L, uh, David told me the other day, within a 60 mile radius, how many institutions of higher ed are there? 14. 14. So that probably is a, a determinant in that particular statistic. This is the slide that uh, is concerning. This is the percentage of adults in our state with a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, right there in, well, we'll actually drill down to Madison County in just a second, but we've gone now from the 83rd percentile of high school graduates, and we've plummeted now to 22 percent uh, in, uh, in Kentucky, which is a full six percentage points below the national average. Now, I'm all, the thing I love about Kentucky is there are points of entry for people across a very broad spectrum of educational opportunities from the community college to a private institution to a state institution like EKU to a large Research One institution. But I would argue an economy in the 21st century has got to be based on a population with some post-secondary certificate, preferably a degree, whether it's associates or bachelors or an advanced degree. Every single demographic or every single longitudinal study out there backs, backs uh, up that, uh, that argument. An economy for the next century has got to be based on an educated populace. I would uh, conclude this section with this, uh, this statement. It is a great time to be in Madison County. Uh, we have an opportunity that is really unique. We're, we're our situation, our population, the university, uh, all these things are coming together, I believe, uh, to make a tremendous impact on our communities uh, writ large throughout our county. Now, what is the impact of Eastern on our community? Let me just share a couple of things with you as it relates to our total enrollment and our uh, current living alumni in Madison County. Now, we got a, a number that I wasn't quite sure was accurate, so I didn't include it tonight, and that was the percentage of our incoming freshman class that is actually from Madison County. And it's actually smaller than you might think. Uh, we need to do a better job, I think, getting kids from Madison Central and even Mass and Southern, but uh, a lot of kids that if they grow up here, they want to kind of go off to college and have that experience. I can completely understand that. But let's say it's a five to 10%, which is probably pretty generous. That means we are bringing into our community roughly 16,000, 15,800 non-residents of Madison County who are paying rent, buying gasoline, buying groceries, having a direct economic impact on our economy on an annual basis. You may not be able to read the fine print. If you can, then uh, good for you. Uh, but this gives you an idea of what the expenditures are as an institution in terms of, uh, let's see, we've got capital expenditures on the right. We've got total maintenance here, the 12 million, the total scholarships and the total in terms of general and administration uh, at the university. Now, the number to keep in mind is $187 million of annual expenditures uh, here at the, at, on campus. What impact does that have on our community? Uh, for the city of Richmond, we pay uh, roughly into the city coffers over $2 million. The state of Con Kentucky gets $5.6 million. And this, uh, this one, I think, is very encouraging. While the as I said, the state average of our or percentage of the population with a bachelor's degree is 21, 22 percent. In Madison, we're almost 27 percent. So that, uh, I think, Mr. Mayor, I think that bodes well for the future. You can see how our, our total employment, over 3,000 uh, employees, and our total compensation of payroll, uh, almost $125 million. A couple of historical things I want to touch on. 
Nick and his crew uh, celebrated today, and we're still counting money because it will continue to come in even after June the 30th. But we had the biggest fundraising year in terms of net receipts uh, to our development office that we've had in 12 years. So that's something to be proud of. So way to go, uh, development office. That $4 million is about half of where we need to be. We need to be between, I would argue, 10 to $12 million a year of uh, private dollars being brought into the institution. This next one is something that I think I'm the most proud of. We have right now, for the incoming freshman class coming to EKU, the highest GPA and the highest ACT scores, so that cumulative, what we call a, uh, an index, the highest on record. Is that true, Laurie? That is true. So uh, that is something we should be very proud of, because what does that lead to? The more prepared a student is when they get here, Billy, what happens to them? They stay. They, uh, as John Calipari would say, they succeed and proceed. That has a different meaning for them, but for us it means they stay here and they graduate and they go on and uh, we hope get a job. And this last little one, uh, a bit about, uh, we're one of the top 125 STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math institutions in the country. Um, and that is from Victory Media that just named us that just a little while ago. Look at the capital projects that are currently underway. And I see Eric Zabilka. Eric, raise your hand. Eric, raise your hand. Eric from Omni uh, uh, Architects has been a great partner in both uh, phases one and two. But look at the economic impact that the science building uh, is going to have or will have on our, uh, on our community. All the suppliers, all the subcontractors, all the hourly wage employment, all the, uh, uh, the direct impact that this project will have on our, uh, on our campus. Another one that I'll talk about tonight is the east side project over at Roy Kidd Stadium. And while it's not nearly as large in scale as uh, Science Phase Two, uh, still in all you can see the impact that it's gonna have on our community uh, in terms of wages and, uh, and supplies. A couple of things I want to talk about as it relates to, uh, to place. Uh, this photograph, I think, uh, kind of captures the campus as uh, was built during the Robert R. Martin days. And I'll show you a slide here uh, that in many ways illustrates that. He was, uh, I certainly, I didn't know him, but I've heard a lot of stories about him. And uh, he's one person I, I wish I had met. Uh, kind of larger than life in, in many ways. You can see him down at the bottom right. That's the president of Moorhead State, and they're fighting over the rifle, I guess, they used to exchange. But uh, this is a different day. We don't exchange rifles anymore. Uh, but he oversaw a building boom that had never been seen uh, at Eastern Kentucky. This chart, I think, helps uh, give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. If you trace our origins back to 1906, and there's a debate, I know, between 1874 and 1906, and my preference is to go even older, because that would make us older than Mer uh, both uh, Moorhead and Western. So there's some value in being more mature. Uh, but if you go back to 1906, look at where our square footage was in terms of millions. It kind of remained static. And Robert R. Martin arrived here in what year? 1960. You had almost a four or five-fold increase in square footage. The challenge we face now is that we are dealing with an infrastructure that is uh, five and six decades old. And there was a tremendous boom to accommodate all the, the uh, GIs coming back uh, and students that wanted to be in college. But that infrastructure is starting to get old and get tired. And our task is to revitalize uh, our campus. To get to this point, there's some people I want to thank. Uh, you're going to see a lot of images tonight from uh, Murphy Graves, and Steve Graves is here. Steve, can you uh, raise your hand? Steve has been a great friend uh, to the university, and you'll see a lot of the images that he's helped us with as we begin to work um, uh, some of the building spaces on campus and try to make things tie in. Also, I want to introduce the, uh, the firm of HEWV all the way from Blacksburg, uh, Virginia. You all raise your hands. Uh, these are the folks that are going to help us uh, with our campus master plan. They'll be back in the fall for an open forum with our community. They, they launched just yesterday on campus, and we're really excited to, uh, to work with them. We've had a lot of donors step forward and help us. The elected officials have been incredibly helpful. Uh, is Carol McGill here? Carol, Carol, stand up, will you please, Carol? 
How long have you worked for the state, Carol? 20 years. Carol's retiring uh, here next month. And he's been a wonderful friend and partner. I know uh, Mal can back me up on that with Science Phase 1. And, and Carol, we thank you very much uh, for your service. Uh, we've also had great contractors to work with and our very own EKU personnel. I want to thank our facilities folks for how hard they work. Uh, can I have all of our facilities folks stand up? I see Ron here. Ed, come on, Ed, stand up. Ron, y'all, Chris, there we go. I hope we never take for granted how hard it is to maintain a campus this size uh, and this diverse and complex, but uh, we're very grateful. So a lot of folks have helped to get, help us uh, get to this point. <clears throat> I would argue that now is our community's finest hour. And I'm going to use an example of uh, one of my heroes, Winston Churchill. And he once said this, and pardon me for reading it, but it's worth stating. To every man or woman comes that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered the chance to do a special thing unique to him and fitted to his talent. What a tragedy if that moment finds him unprepared or unqualified for the work which would be his finest hour. Uh, I hope I'm a man of faith. I believe I am. I believe I'm here with my colleagues and all of you at a really unique moment in history. And it didn't just happen because. Uh, it's not happenstance. We are here to, together to work together on behalf of an institution that will be here far beyond our tenure and beyond our service uh, to this great institution. Uh, it really falls to us to take advantage of this moment. Because I never, I don't know if we'll ever get it again. I really don't. One of my other heroes is this uh, gentleman right here. Uh, Mr. Burnham said a lot of great things and a lot of interesting things, but one that he said uh, as it relates to make no little plans, and I won't take the time to read the whole thing, but the last paragraph uh, about remember that our sons and grandsons and granddaughters are going to do things which would stagger us. Let your watchword be order and your beacon beauty. What we build here is going to uh, be looked to uh, as an example, I hope, that our watchword was beauty uh, and uh, we wanted to leave something far beyond our time at this campus. Does anybody know who this is? Anybody? Anybody want to take a stab at that? And this is my last historical example as we lead into uh, what we want to do now. This is William J. Fields, and he was the governor of Kentucky in the 1920s. I did not know who he was until last Thursday night when Professor James Clotter of Georgetown spoke to us at Leadership Kentucky. And before he talked about uh, Governor Fields, I asked him, I said, you know, as Americans, we love lists. We're always talking about the top 10 or the top 25. If you had to rank your top five Kentuckians of all time, who would they be? Now, I'll ask this group, who do you think he put as number one? Henry Clay. Interestingly enough, his biography of Henry Clay is coming out next month with Oxford University Press, and it is, uh, by all accounts, the definitive work, Cradle of Grave, on, uh, on he said, the greatest statesman uh, in, in Kentucky history and probably one of the greatest Americans uh, uh, ever. Number two, Robert Penn Warren from Guthrie, Kentucky, the only writer who's won a Pulitzer Prize for both fiction and poetry. Uh, wrote a great book called uh, All the King's Men uh, and uh, hailed from, uh, from uh, Kentucky. Number three, we have a real affinity for him here. We got a statue of him, Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone. Number four, a woman I didn't know much about, I've done a little research on her since, Madeline McDowell Breckenridge, a progressive movement leader and a wonderful suffragist who at age 20 lost her leg. Uh, and think about it, this is the 19 teens, 1920s. Uh, for most people, that would be just absolutely devastating. And she was fitted with a wooden leg, and that didn't stop her at all. And he said one of the greatest uh, females and one of the greatest Kentuckians ever. And then his fifth greatest Kentuckian was John Marshall Harlan, the great dissenter, uh, who was the lone dissenting vote in the Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, those are incredible people. 
He talked about them uh, in his talk, but then he talked about William J. Fields in the context of lost opportunities. He said, Kentuckians have accomplished a great deal, but unfortunately we can also be described as a group, as a state, that has lost out on some wonderful opportunities. And he focused on four. I'm only going to talk about one, and it has to do with this gentleman right here. He was the governor in the 1920s, and in 1924, uh, the sitting governor, um, he was kind of an accidental governor because the, car the party's nominee died of appendicitis, and the Democratic Party got together and said, here's our guy, and he won. Uh, he, uh, his opponent called him, uh, he, he called himself Honest Bill from Olive Hill, but his opponent, and this is what I like, his opponent called him Dodge, Dodging Bill from Olive Hill, who answers no questions and never will. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you may want to use that sometime. Uh, when he was in office, he decided that it was time for Kentucky to be bold. Now, granted, put, you know, put yourself in the historical moment here, early 1920s, 1924. He proposed a bond issuance of $75 million. Now, the state budget at the time was $25 million. So if you keep the same ratios, if you were alive today, it would be a bond issuance of $20 billion. And he said, we are going to issue these bonds, and they're going to go for roads, charitable institutions, schools, and prisons. And guess what? The state legislature passed it. Uh, it kind of bifurcated the state. Uh, the Louisville papers were against it. The Lexington papers were for it. Uh, it did pass the legislature, but they then had to go to a vote to the public, and it lost by 90,000 votes. And Professor Clotter said this. He said this. Um, it became an urban-rural split, and as the road-poor and education-poor areas supported it, the urban places did not. The vote came, and the bond issue went down by 90,000 votes. For a long time afterwards, Kentucky would be called the detour state, and its schoolhouses would be poor matches for its horse barns. Think about what would have happened if that bond issue had passed, and Kentucky had built an infrastructure to rival anything in the country. I don't want us to look back on our time here uh, at EKU and think what could have been, what might have been, if we had been bold and full of uh, hope and, uh, and vision and, uh, and temerity. What I'd like to talk about to conclude, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to questions and comments, is uh, talk a little bit about this proposed Center for Student Life. Um, I see a few students here. Um, we had our, uh, the students that voted in support of a fee to support really two projects, uh, the renovation of a student union and the construction of a new uh, recreation center. Those are kind of the core of what uh, we're doing to renovate this part of campus, but it's much more than that. And so I'd like to begin by uh, kind of showing you what we're talking about. If you can see from this diagram, the center of campus, this epicenter of campus, if I were a freshman and I lived in McGregor Hall, chances are I could get everything within about a 300 meter radius uh, of what I need. And from food and dining to counseling to the registrar's office over in the Whitlock building to recreation opportunities in Weaver to the library to going to class to going to the student union, it's all right there. Now, as you can see, a lot of those buildings are getting looking a little old and a little decrepit, and that's what we're talking about is to revitalize uh, this middle of campus. So when you hear the phrase, the Center for Student Life, it's much bigger than the two projects I just mentioned, the rec center and the renovation of the uh, Powell building. We're also talking about new residence halls. And we are going to do on a much smaller scale uh, like they did at UK with public-private partnerships where we put out, and it's I think gone out already or in the process of going out, the RFP to, uh, we hope, entice firms to bid on maybe three, maybe fewer than that, but $75 million worth of brand new beds to replace our, our old uh, uh, bed inventory that we currently have. Now you may have heard that at our last Board of Regents meeting we had our board approve the demolition of Martin, Todd, and Dupree. As you can imagine, we had a lot of Greek students call my office and other places 
uh, worried that they had no place to live next fall. They were safe for several months, if not years. Uh, our, our challenge really is, and this is where we're going to work with our firms and our planners, and Paul Gano. Paul, will you please stand up? Paul starts tomorrow, uh, and I want to thank Ed Herzog for his years of service. Uh, Paul is going to be our facilities administration uh, director, um, and he's going to help shepherd through uh, the process at the state level and through these RFP processes, uh, all these various projects that we have in the pipeline. We, the challenge we face is making sure we don't displace populations of students in dormitories, in residence halls, uh, as we build new ones and as we tear down old ones. But the one that you'll see probably um, uh, start immediately uh, after the new year is the, uh, the, the demolition of Martin Hall and the replacement on the same, same site of a brand new residence hall uh, right there on the same footprint. We're also looking for a food vendor, whether it's Aramark or, uh, or somebody else, we'll put it out to bid, uh, to either renovate Weaver and turn that into our dining facility or possibly build a new dining facility, uh, not, dis not dissimilar to what uh, they've done at other places. If you've been up at UK recently, I think they've built a $45 million, is that how much it is, Paul, dining facility uh, at UK. Uh, also, we're looking at uh, the possibility of partnering with a private uh, company uh, for a wellness center and indoor practice facility. This is different from uh, the rec center. There are other enhancement projects that you can see on the right side of the Karloftis Garden, which we hope will begin here uh, shortly. Um, the student wellness center, as in a, uh, a health clinic. Um, you've seen, I hope, the new plaza out in front of the Crab Library and the Weaver Building. And part of that also is the, uh, uh, the Knoll Reading Porch, which I'll show you in just one second. We were not approved the last session to do a multi-level parking garage uh, with bonding authority, so we hope that during this next session that may be something we make a request. And Representative Smart, if you could help us with that, we would be uh, most grateful. This is what you're going to see here in the next uh, little while, um, the new entrance point at the intersection of Barnes Mill Road and Lancaster Avenue. Uh, Steve and his firm did, did the design. Uh, that's Indiana limestone uh, with some brick pavers that lead you into uh, the center of campus. Um, this is being paid for with some institutional funds, but also a donor. And we'll reveal that donor here shortly because it will be named for, for him and his wife and his parents, both of whom were EKU graduates. Uh, so there's a really great tie to campus and uh, we believe this is going to be a great focal point as one comes into campus. Now these are renderings, uh, nothing firm, but one thing we would like to improve is that first point of access that a person has when they come to campus as a perspe uh, prospective student. So Steve's firm has done an initial design of what will go where the old tennis courts went, or where they used to be, excuse me. So this would be a, what we call a EKU alumni and welcome center uh, with some parking underneath. So you solve a couple of problems. One is the parking problem, but number two, you elevate your building so you can actually see it from Lancaster above that wall that is currently along uh, the avenue. Um, we envision this as the place where Johnny or Sally comes with mom and dad, they park their car, they go inside for their orientation, uh, they maybe sit in a small auditorium, they learn about the history of Eastern Kentucky University. On the back side will be the new residence hall that they can tour on the space of where Martin currently is, and they then go into that center of, uh, for student life. You have your dining hall, you have your library, you have your renovated student union right there. And that is the first impression people see, and it's easy to find, it's accessible, and it's welcoming. And uh, it would also be uh, an alumni facility for our, our graduates. So that is uh, kind of the initial design. Steve, anything you want to say about that? And this is all privately funded. Uh, we're not going to ask the state for anything uh, to help with this. This will be done through private donations. What have we done in the past 18 months? I want to show you just a couple things that they're cosmetic, yes, to, uh, to be sure, but I hope they've made a difference, and I hope you've noticed the difference. One is the rebrand of, uh, of Arlington. Arlington is a university asset. It is a wonderful thing for our community, but it is owned by the university, and we are incredibly proud of it. 
Uh, it's great to go out there and enjoy time with family and friends and to show prospective faculty and donors uh, this wonderful facility. And uh, we've invested in the house. Uh, you'll continue to see improvements out there. But the rebrand was, was very intentional. University Club says who owns it. Uh, and we're responsible for it, and we're going to do a better job uh, of maintaining it. That said, I think Jim and his crew out there is the best around. The way they keep the course, and Todd's doing a great job, and uh, we're really proud of, uh, of Arlington. What have we done at a place like Alumni Coliseum? A great old building, the largest wood span ceiling in the world, uh, but it was looking a little tired. This is what the floor used to look like on the left. And uh, when we decided we wanted to put a new floor down and we found out that asbestos was in the old floor, uh, we thought, well, let's just build the new floor on top of the old floor, uh, which is exactly what we did. But you can see the difference in the lighting, uh, in the floor design. Um, as we can afford it, we intend to do a ribbon board around the top of, uh, of the arena. Um, but it's, it's lighter, it's more inviting, and it looks great on TV. And the Colonel head is facing the right way, so we're very happy about that. This is uh, the game that was on national TV against Belmont on ESPN back in February. The science building is uh, phase two is currently under construction. When this is completed, John and his faculty are going to have a 340,000 square feet of space. There is nothing like it anywhere in Kentucky. I, Eric, I don't know. Is there anything in the region that, that even compares to this? $128 million. So the next time you see Jared or Rita Smart or other state legislators, I hope that you'll thank them. Uh, the Commonwealth completely, I mean, they wholly supported this project. And it's going to change forever our uh, science programs. To have everybody under one roof and get Mal Frisbee out of the Moore Memorial Science Building. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, Mal may chain himself to the door and not want to leave. Okay, uh, we are really excited about uh, what this building means to us, uh, to our campus. Our new hall, uh, we're still looking for a name for it, um, but not only the newest, the, the first addition to our uh, bed inventory in 40 years, but also LEED Gold certified uh, and the first of its kind in the state for a residence hall. Just something as simple as signage, uh, I think has made a big difference. I wanna thank the mayor and the City Commission for helping out as well. Along Lancaster, you've probably seen the new signs that are all maroon. We're still waiting for the ones on Main Street. They're well, they're blue, that's the problem. <laughs> the, uh, I, I, seriously, I wanna thank uh, the city for helping with, uh, with that. Also, we partnered on the, the water tank branding project, which I think uh, is, has been helpful and a, and a, a nice addition to our community. There are four of them, they've all been repainted and all rebranded. New tennis courts. We took out the courts along Lancaster and built them up there next to the Adams Tennis Center. And my neighbor, Freddie Ballou, says it's a great surface. I've yet to play on them, uh, but uh, a great investment in, uh, in our athletic facilities. Let me touch on just a few projects within, again, um, uh, the larger scope of the renovation. The Powell Building, uh, our intention is to take the food preparation and service elements out of PAL and put them into a new dining facility and make this completely stu student centric. So to gut it stem to stern and let students tell us what spaces they want. Do they want a small you know, dollar theater? Do they want places for clubs? We've actually proposed a, the idea of a faculty student lounge where faculty and students can grab a cup of coffee or a bagel and discuss issues, uh, class assignments, whatever. We have a chance really in the middle of our campus to renovate a facility uh, that is so integral to everything that we're doing at the university. Laurie, anything you want to say about that? Okay. Uh, right behind, of course, the PAL building is the new plaza, and the reading porch will be done here in the next few weeks. Ed, when is that going to be done? Ed? Okay, all right. <laughs> Just checking. We're almost done, Ed. <laughs> Middle of July. And uh, completely funded by a, a donor, uh, the Knowles, out of uh, Northern Kentucky, who, uh, of course, funded the Knowles Studio. I think we put some institutional resources into it as well. But the idea was to create a space 
on the exterior of the building where access could be controlled, but students can go outside and read and hang out and study. And it's going to be a great space. And you face what I believe is one of the most beautiful buildings we have on campus, the Weaver Building. And it's a wonderful facade. That's what it's going to look like at, at, uh, at night. Right there on the corner, uh, we took out some of those ball fields, and we're in the process of, of working with Model to, uh, to relocate some of those. But what will go on the corner there, of course, uh, once we get the funding from the state, is a new Model Lab School. This is, uh, in talking to the architects today, they said, what about the lab school? You know, what are your plans? So well, our plans are to continue to support the only remaining model lab school in Kentucky and one of the few in the country. And I hope you all saw the rankings. We have the third best high school in Kentucky, uh, according to this ranking that came out just 10 days ago. And uh, the, the lab school will go right there on the corner, which will then free up all the space behind it for future academic expansion either for our College of Education or other facilities that we need uh, at the university. So we won't have to disrupt at all the school year of Model Lab. You build a new school on the corner there while the old school is still in session. You occupy this, you then raise the school behind it. And that's what it is uh, proposed uh, to look like. We also put uh, lights on both the baseball and the softball fields. Uh, first time they've ever had the chance to play at night. Let me conclude by talking just a little bit about our proposed athletic and activity facility improvements. The first is Earl Combs Stadium. And some have said, well, you're going to keep Turkey Hughes' name on the field. Absolutely. But when we build this new facility, it's going to be named for one of the most famous Richmondites uh, ever, Earl Combs, who batted lead off the New York Yankees and is in the Hall of Fame and was the chair of our board. And that is the proposed uh, stadium. Uh, you can see about 1,000 seats, but much more comfortable than we have now and much more handsome uh, than one sees currently uh, off the bypass. Another facility that we propose as we raise the money to do it is a new softball facility. So over there by uh, the facility's maintenance uh, buildings, um, the f new uh, softball complex would be kind of shoehorned right in there. Roy Kidd Stadium, when it was built, uh, I think prior to the Science Building, if I'm not mistaken, was the build biggest building on campus. It's nine stories high. Uh, you may not know this, but it was designed and constructed by the same firm as uh, did Western Kentucky University Stadium, same year. Now, they spent quite a bit of money in renovating theirs. Theirs is a little different in that it's on a, in a little bit of an angle. Uh, they built a new grandstand on the other side. Uh, but we believe uh, we can do something similar, not to what they've done at Notre Dame, because uh, they also have $450 million. Uh, but the concept of what they've done at Notre Dame to us is inspiring. How many of you have been at Notre Dame Stadium? Anybody? Probably arguably one of the most iconic football stadiums uh, in, the, in the country. The, the, uh, the president there, Father Jenkins, said, why do we only use this six days a year? Why don't we build around it elements that our students will use every single day, uh, every hour? So they are spending uh, a boatload of money to build around the football stadium. Uh, on the east side is going to be all the athletic complex, training facility, tutoring labs, uh, athletic administration offices. On the south end, uh, facing the Hesburg Library and Touchdown Jesus, is going to be the School of Music, their Conservatory of Music. So imagine sitting in a practice room, practicing your scales while you're looking up at uh, Touchdown Jesus uh, there in, in the distance. On the west side is going to be their student union and their rec center. And they're now saying this is going to be the crossroads of our campus. We thought, why not do something on a much smaller scale uh, at EKU that will be used by the community every single day and by our students every single day. What we came up with was on the east side a, a grandstand that would house uh, new locker rooms, uh, new offices for our football staff, and this is what the, uh, the architects are proposing right now, kind of a cantilevered um, uh, roof there. Uh, the, the things you see on the right there, kind of the maroon shade, those are all seats that would be in a horseshoe shape, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. But when we tore out the old grandstand on the east side, this is what's going to replace it. 
the funding is in place, the design continues, and our hope and our expectation is to have this done in time for the 2016 season. Isn't that correct, Paul? Okay, all right. Steve, are we on board? Okay, all right. What we're proposing in the space uh, of Begley is the new rec center that our students approved of 140,000 square feet. And whatever we do to build a stadium will have to be done privately. We'll have to go out and raise the money to do the suites and the stands and what other uh, accoutrements we want to do with the stadium. But the idea is, is to create a space that our students will use all the time, that our community could have access to, with, as you can see on the east side, uh, the football building, uh, that then kind of closes off in a horseshoe, uh, if you will, along the bypass. These are, all, again, all initial designs, all initial renderings. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work to, to do. We want a lot of student input. Uh, we met with the students and talked to them about this idea. They're very excited and very supportive. But this is where we would have graduation as opposed to what we currently have uh, in Begley, that Roy Kidd. So there is the interior of what is proposed for uh, the new facility. And I think it would be a very handsome addition to our campus and very uh, useful and uh, very welcome. With that, I have come to the conclusion of my remarks, and I am happy to field any questions you might have, and I'll turn it over to David. Thank you very much. I think we've got some bold vision. Uh, I think we're, for those of us who, uh, as a proud alum of this institution, uh, I'm excited to see where EKU is going. I know many in this group uh, share that same passion, that same desire. And Dr. Benson, we appreciate the vision that you share uh, for, for Eastern and how that's going to hopefully enable and empower and make Richmond and Madison County a better place for everyone who's here. So we, we very much appreciate that. Um, with that in mind, uh, let me take just a moment. Um, this is a wonderful facility that we're in, and, and I want to thank the, the center staff and, and those folks for, for all their help uh, for setting this up, and it's a wonderful space and a great asset for our community. So let's give them a round of applause if you don't mind. So let's open it up uh, to some questions. Uh, do, we, do we have some questions from the audience? We can circulate a mic around if need be. I uh, may have Matt grab his wireless mic there if need be. Yes, sir, Mr. House. Well, uh, we've yet to craft the RFP for uh, uh, our food vendor. It, right now, Aramark's still our provider, and we'll continue that relationship. But we've had discussions with them uh, as to their inclination to invest in our campus in exchange for a longer contract. And as they've looked around campus, either on the footprint of McGregor, McGregor or taking Weaver and gutting it and turning that into a dining facility, that's one of the options. I think the mayor had a question. Mayor. Is this on? You're live. Oh, I'm not scared. <laughs> you know, it's more of a comment than, than a, a question. It, you know, when, uh, when I first got in office and when President Benson came into at the university. I truly believe in life there's a window of opportunity that we get. And if we don't take advantage of it, we never get that window open. And I think it behooves all, not only the university, but the city of Richmond and the county and everybody to get on board. And I challenge the commissioners that we all sit down together and piggyback on the university, because I've, I've, I've said this time and time again, as the university grows, so do we. You know, and that's, that's our window of opportunity. When you travel around the state, you know, I hear people talk about uh, going to Owensboro for an example. Now, Owensboro has something that we don't have. We have something they don't have. We've got a major university and they got a river. <laughs> and, and, but, but they're compatible to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really, there's, there's got to be things in the community that make it grow. I mean, if it wasn't a university, maybe it would be a river. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe a, 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 an airport, things of that nature. 
that allows communities like Richmond to take advantage of. And I want to commend you all for what you're doing, and the vision is awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. No other questions. This is usually a very talkative group. Yes, they're here in the back, Ms. Dr. Jones. I'll start, and then I want to turn it over to, uh, to Barry to talk about um, what's going on. David, you can maybe talk about what's going to happen along Lancaster, too, the project that's going to the walkway there. Uh, Alice, as you know, we've tried uh, for a long time to see how we could push vehicular traffic to the perimeter. And as our architects and our team met today, this was one of our first areas of focus, is how to make particularly that center of campus more navigable and more pedestrian friendly. And it's going to take working with the city, with the, uh, the cemetery board, about what possible routes are on the uh, exterior perimeter of, of campus that we might be able to utilize to make it harder to get a car in the middle of campus and easier for you on foot or on a bike. Now, Laurie, are we still pursuing the bike idea like they have in New York where you can just hop on a bike and leave it at your, you want to talk about that? Yes, our uh, campus rec uh, department is currently in the process of investigating a system um, whereby bikes would be available um, similar to in New York City where you can pick them up in one location and drop them off in another. And Barry, do you want to talk about how kind of uh, other things that we're doing? Sure, yeah, and Alice, you're, you're right. With when, when we looked at, we had our launch meeting yesterday and today with HEWV, and one of the slides that they shared in their initial overview was a snapshot of all the parking areas on our campus and how much it really uh, struck me is how much space that takes up in the core of campus. So if you think about ways that you might mitigate some of that or remove some of that or do parking structures here and there and whatnot and free up that space and make it more pedestrian friendly, what that means for adding more green spaces adding more uh, uh, focal points for students to gather or to have these unintentional or intentional bumps with, with faculty and staff, it really opens up your mind to think about what might be possible when you really think seriously about moving cars out of the core of campus. The other part that's going to be a challenge for us as a university is the cultural change that's going to be required to separate ourselves from our vehicles. Um, and that's really going to be a challenge. I mean, we, all, we all are facing that kind of head on. One of the other things you mentioned, too, that we, we uh, uh, touched on with our group as we met was the blending of the borders with the city and the, uh, and the college. We want to get to a point where you don't really realize it when you navigate from, from downtown into campus or however you enter the campus. We want you to know when you're on campus because we need more their gateways are going to help do some of that. But we also want to, to make it more um, uh, blended, if you will. I mean, even if there are places downtown where students can gather and congregate and maybe even have the Wi-Fi that's, that doesn't, doesn't end at campus, but you can navigate downtown to the coffee shop and have the same Wi-Fi, just as an example, and extend study spaces downtown, if you will. Just some, just some neat things to think about as we, as we delve into this planning process. And two other initiatives on that front. Uh, we, we've been fortunate to, to, to receive a TAP grant to uh, extend the sidewalk down Lancaster Avenue to uh, the entry point uh, toward the Stratton Building and Perkins. So there'll, be, there'll now be a sidewalk extended all the way down there, and that'll be lit appropriately. And then we're going to uh, try to reinstitute the Colonel Walk, which would uh, start at the Daniel Boone statue and go all the way to the courthouse uh, up 2nd Street uh, and really invite our, our faculty, our staff, and our students uh, to come downtown uh, to, to patronize those businesses downtown, to engage in uh, you know, those, those activities downtown, to go study, uh, to, to go to Purdy's and have a, a cup of coffee and a, and a bagel and still be able to feel like they're on
on campus. And uh, so we're looking forward to those opportunities and maybe even the opportunity to embed some of some of our facilities and some of our units in the downtown footprint as well. So we're very excited about those opportunities going forward. Magistrate Tudor. Have you looked into the possibility of building a high rise garage parking facility and make that uh, more space for the uh, buildings where your uh, parking uh, lots are? And, and Something like uh, Western has, they have, I think, two high-rise uh, parking facilities down there. Barry, would you want to? Yeah, we, we, we have that on our plan. Uh, we have that. We, we do a six-year plan with the state, and we've, we've got those projects on our request list as well. So what the, the, the thing that we have to be good about is where we locate those and make sure they're in the right spots for, for the residence halls, for the staff and faculty and whatnot. And if I might, John, one spot that we've, we've uh, kind of identified, which I think would be perfect, and we'll defer to our experts to corroborate that. Uh, but right as you look at the AC, you know that ugly two abandoned tennis courts right there that have a fence around them? Uh, and we're proposing maybe a multi-level lot uh, faced with brick with the pitch roof on it so your car would be protected that's in an L shape that then goes in the outfield of the baseball. Uh, so you're servicing your athletic complexes, your uh, housing, um, alumni coliseum, because as you know at graduation, that's one of our biggest limiting, limiting factors is getting people in and out of the parking lots to accommodate for big events. So we have various spots on campus, but that one would be, I think, uh, kind of equidistant to a lot of different things that serve a lot of different populations. Yes, ma'am. We speak of I think you make a great point and uh, I think for for the commissioners and for the mayor and I, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for us to partner together to look at opportunities to, to do just that to, to make those connections and uh, and to look at possible uh, funding opportunities grant opportunities uh, and I think that we're excited to, to start down that road together and I think that you know a, a forum like this is really a chance for us to hear those things and and encourage us to to engage in those conversations about about moving forward together and I think that uh, mayor or, or any of the commissioners would, would you like to make any comments on that well we uh, we've uh, the commission and I we have discussed sidewalks in in the city you know sidewalks are kind of like a lot of our buildings you know they're just old and you know and, and for us to for an example I think she was talking on Barnes Mill uh, you know for us to get easements it, it's a slow process but we are looking at uh, putting new sidewalks in from in the entrance of town coming to Main Street. Uh, we're also looking at uh, looking putting sidewalks on the north side of Barnes Mill. But that's, you know, we have to get, it's people's property, we have to get easements. And, and we haven't, truthfully, we haven't gone through that process of asking for easements there because we're actually starting on the other side. One of the comments that you made, David, that I think is important, especially to the, for the city, it would be to me is in, in part of your comprehensive plan. If we want a, if we want to have a blend, we need to understand what we're blending, because we, you know we have different challenges, whether it be zoning, uh, easements, is it a state road, is it a county road, is it a city road? Th those are things that we need to have. And it's, and it's, and if you're looking at your comprehensive plan, and we were blending say from. Uh, and we, we, we've got plans ourselves to go 2nd and 3rd Street and blend that area. But most of that area for us 
is either retail or single-family dwellings, whereas you all are looking at it as multifamily. And so we, you know, I think it's important for us to be very aware of, of your plans, especially in the areas that we want it to blend. You know, uh, the sidewalks are a, a great idea. I think, you know, the more people we have walking and riding bikes and exercise, the, the less active traffic congestion we get. So, but we are looking at, at, at a lot of those things, and a lot of it will dictate, especially in the blending areas, as to what we do with it. Well, we're looking very forward, our, our master planning group, uh, to sitting down uh, with a working group with, with the commission for sure, uh, having some community forums and really trying to open that up and, and, and integrate those things. I think that's, uh, to, we wanted to share this vision tonight, uh, to have an opportunity to kind of let everyone see where we're going. And I think we've got to find those points of entry where we can work together to, to share in the opportunities uh, to build those things. So I think you're exactly right, Mayor. And we're looking forward to that, engaging in those conversations this fall with, with the group that we have. And they're outstanding. We, we're really excited to have them working with us. Commissioner Morgan. I appreciate your vision. It's, it's bold. It's exciting. And, and I love it, especially coming from uh, being an Eastern grad. Uh, two questions um, what do you need specifically from the city of Richmond to make your vision happen we're in support I, I suspect that we're in support of it tell us what you need be very blunt very frank with us how can we help you make this happen question two you talked about public and, and private partnerships are you willing to take those partnerships off campus um, more to the downtown area, as you discuss the the, the Wi-Fi and the down t in, in, in Purdy's, mm -hmm. are you willing to take them to help her out on the sidewalks down Barnes Mill? Uh, I'll answer the. That's okay. The first, the second question first. I'll refer to our legal counsel. No. <laughs> uh, I, I think all options are out there, and if there's an opportunity for us to partner in, with local businesses, uh, with local organizations in a way that benefits all of us, uh, everything is, is, is free game. Um, I hope if there's anything that kind of uh, denotes this era at, at EKU is that we're looking for all the chances to push the university forward and our community forward. So if uh, that comes in the, in the form of the partnerships that you described, we're all, we're all for them and we'll be happy to discuss them. What we could use from you, um, first, I should have said this at the outset, while I wanted to show you some of the images and some of the ideas, this is all still very fluid. Uh, as they had the construction term, as you know, design, build, uh, and in a lot of ways this is what we're doing. We want input from our students as to what they want in the facilities input from our city partners as to how to make that interface with downtown as seamless as possible, how we could improve the infrastructure that leads you to campus, uh, how you can partner with us to maybe look at some of the traffic patterns and how we might look at different um, orientations. Um, I don't know if you saw, uh, this is a suggestion from Mr. Kaloftis, we'll see what he says, but you all know that intersection that's very problematic right there next to Moberly right now in the track. It's that stop light right there that's always a mess. Well, right next to it is the old abandoned uh, observatory that was donated to EKU by the University of Kentucky. And anybody know what's in there? Storage. We got storage in there right now. And the idea was to take off the lid, take off the top, which is a beautiful copper top, and uh, maybe make it a design element of the garden, uh, a cupola of some sort, uh, like a little uh, place where, where one gathers, and create a, either a roundabout or a better trafficked area that could then lead to a perimeter road on the outside of campus and make the, the hill and down into the middle of campus uh, pedestrian only. Um, I was at the University of Oregon just a couple weeks ago to see a couple of our kids run and had a chance to go visit that campus. I'd love to do that because you get to steal some good ideas, we hope. But they have along the perimeter of their campus several one-way streets and one that literally bisected the middle of campus. And they approached the city and said, we want to take that out and make it accessible only to emergency vehicles. And now it's the place where everybody goes to congregate. You know, they have the, 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 the uh, kind of stanchions that keep out vehicles 
and allow for fire trucks or, or emergency vehicles, but it's become much more pedestrian uh, friendly. So what we can use from you, Commissioner, is the chance to sit down with our architects and talk about ways that the campus and the city um, interface with each other. And uh, if there are projects we can work together uh, and, and fund together, we, we would welcome that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, again, the second question first, I, I had a chance along with the mayor, I think members of the city commission to talk about a, a potential buyer of the Glendon and uh, he came up on campus. We had a really nice visit. I don't know what's come of that, but we'll continue to partner um, with any potential buyers for that property. Um, there are plans on the books for a uh, hotel that a private developer would come in and, and build on our land. We haven't pursued it at all uh, because I think when the center, and you all, there's some out there that know more than I, uh, when the center was built, I know that was kind of part of it. The challenge we face, and Dan McBride can back me up, if a opposing football team comes to, t to town to play us, guess where they stay? Lexington. Exit 104 where there's a, a hotel and a conference center that can accommodate a team and they can do a walkthrough. We don't have anything like that in town. I'm delighted to see the Marriott Town Play Suites going in and any the, in the other development, but if we could have something on campus adjacent to this facility where artists would actually stay there instead of going elsewhere, uh, Jill, you know what I'm talking about. Skip, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that's why I didn't talk about it. It's uh, We were approached six months ago or so by a firm that has keen interest in it, and uh, we'll continue those conversations. Yes? What is it, Matt? Not much bigger. I mean, our, we're, our goal is to create a game day environment that's more enjoyable, make it more intimate, less vertical, more horizontal. Uh, get kind of people packed in there and, and uh, improve that experience. Yes, Commissioner. Will it still be the Roy Kidd Stadium? Uh, I had dinner with the coach last night and uh, there's no way I could ever go to Roy Kidd and tell him that we're building a new stadium and it doesn't bear his name. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's uh, a good thing. <laughs> he, uh, you know, Roy Kidd uh, built our football program. I mean, we had a great program before, but Roy Kidd is Eastern Kentucky University football. And uh, I'm so proud of him and Sue, and we all are. So, yes, I anticipate it will be named the Roy Kidd Stadium. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and still Roy and Sue Kidd Drive, by the way. All right. Okay, good. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, stadium presented by Kane's Chicken. I mean, we could do any number yeah, of things. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> As you know, they have a very resourceful ways of, uh, for naming opportunities. But uh, Roy Kidd, is, uh, he's an he's a institutional treasure, really. Anybody else? I, m I mentioned uh, the process, and I hope that you will take to heart uh, our encouraging your participation. Um, our architects will be here as we have design meetings about other facilities. We hope you'll come and participate, but uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll end where we started. That this is a really unique moment in our history. And like the mayor said, this is a window. And if we don't take advantage of it, um, I think we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll end with a, a Harry Truman story. You can't, you can't finish without a Harry Truman story. Harry Truman, Secretary of State, uh, who won a, a Pulitzer Prize for his memoir was uh, Dean Acheson. And you could not have found two more polar opposite people than Harry Truman and Dean Acheson. Dean Acheson had gone to Groton and Harvard and Yale, and Harry Truman was the only president in the last century who didn't graduate college. And Acheson dedicated his memoir to Harry Truman. And if you open up the first page, it says to Harry Truman, the captain with the mighty heart. 
and he had enormous respect for President Truman. And he once said the greatest attribute of Harry Truman was he was devoid of the most enfeebling of human emotions, regret. Think about that. Regret does you no good. There's nothing you can do about yesterday. All you can do is act on today and plan for the future. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, our other elected officials, we are not going to regret wasting this opportunity. This is going to be our moment. Uh, and I need your help. We need your help. Uh, but it's an exciting time to be at EKU. Thank you very much for being here. And go Colonels. I'll talk to you. We want to extend a, a warm welcome to our, our great appreciation to our elected officials for coming. Uh, we'd ask you to stick around. We got a little bit of uh, fruit, uh, a few desserts. Um, our President's Council hopefully can hang around for a few minutes. Uh, these folks are subject matter experts on any number of things that you might have a question about. So we'll try to hang around for a few minutes if you've got some questions. Uh, we do appreciate everyone's time and we look forward to having the partnerships and discussions going forward as to how we make uh, the impossible possible. So thank you all very much. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Okay.